So with, uh, without further ado, then our speaker, Gabe Hope Cohen and Daniel Bookner from uh, TBD Web5, what it is and how we are going to get there uh, presenting today. Um, yeah, just to say hi and thanks for having us. It's exciting to be speaking to this group and uh, we've been working on this stuff for almost a year now and happy to, to share what we've been up to and interested to hear your thoughts and questions um, at the end. Um, Daniel, do you want to kick it off and I'll jump yeah, in? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, so so Web Five, you know, you may have heard this announcement. You know, maybe sounds kind of funny just then. Um, it, it wasn't wasn't it was somewhat of a joke, uh, but but, it, but the actual stuff we're working on isn't, isn't uh, intended to be. Um, the realization of you know looking at people aspirationally thinking of decentralization in maybe the Web Three community is that um, maybe maybe there's a different way to go about it. Uh, to achieve some of the common goals that I think the Web3 community espouses. Um, you know, not everything that they want is, is not without merit. It's, it's, uh, it's more a realization of how we get there. So Web5 is a cheeky way to say like, hey, like, why don't we just skip to maybe a better solution uh, to, to realize some of those aspirations? Um, so yeah, maybe next slide. Just one thing to add there. A lot of people have made the analogy of read and then read write and then read write own for web one web two and web three and someone asked me what is web five and i'd say it's read write own minus tokens it's a way to say you could do all those things that web three does but without requiring everything or most things on chain or to be financialized okay so what what is it um Let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what do we mean when we say Web5? Like, what's the intent? Um, well, the web of today is really modeled around people, you know, sort of throwing their data up to a bunch of silos, a um, bunch of you know, custodians, even, even when it's not required. Sometimes it is. I mean, sometimes you give your data to someone else because, you know, the intent is actually very clear that they are, you know, supposed to have it and, and custody it. But a lot of times it's just happenstance that the apps and services we use do that as part of the backbone of the web we've created. Um, but not necessarily does that have to be the case. So what we kind of want is, is a web where as much as possible as, as is practical, data and uh, identity and proofs and everything really about the apps and services and digital landscape is, resides with you as the individual. Um, now it's not 100%. I don't, you know, no one has these delusions like in some other ecosystems that everything's gonna be on some blockchain or, you know, everything's gonna be, there's not gonna be companies or anything like that. Like, you know, what we're trying to do is, is take a practical stance to restoring some control and ownership to users um, that we lack today. Cool. So, you know, we see that there's three pillars of this of Web5 um, to be able to realize a really, truly new web that's, you know, sort of, uh, I think, worthy of being versioned, um, even though I think that part of our goal is to destroy this sort of silly versioning of the web numbers um, by just completely skipping web four and making a fool out of all of it. Um, but I think to, to really get there, we need these three pillars. One is decentralized identifiers. Uh, so people can own the IDs that actually underpin the statements that they make. Uh, if you don't own your Twitter ID, which you don't, um, you could be taken from you. And obviously it's great that you might have a copy of all your tweets, but no one really knows the connection to the ID, right? So the IDs are what makes things meaningful in a referential sense. Uh, if you don't own them, uh, you just have custody over a bunch of bits in reality. Uh, VCs are how you can express trust, right? So you can build a better web of trust, have more reliable personal and business relationships in the digital world. And I think everyone here is familiar with the first two. Um, and then the last one is, you know, we need a personal data storage and relay capability that's native to the web. We call these things decentralized web nodes. We're building them in diff. Um, we have a very active build out of them in block. Um, and that spec is maturing at a rapid clip. We think that that really, you know, most of the activity happens in that third one, which is seen here. You know, there's some features that we're kind of enumerating here. One is universal addressability via DID service endpoints. So the ability, um, if someone wants to, to say something back to you, uh, express data to you, to be able to address a DID's personal data store, to, to go get maybe some public information, like it might be tweets, it might be 
um, information about a business, right? Like basic, uh, you know, basic business information. It could be, um, you know, things like images from a restaurant, right? You can imagine if you have a world where Google Maps is not the sole controller of all the businesses' data, it maybe it resides with businesses and they can express it themselves. So being universally addressable is super important. We don't have really that control today. We can only make websites that are kind of lost in the sea and don't have any real semantic meaning. Um, we want these to be replicated because if they're just with one controlled entity, like if you just picked one drive or G drive or Dropbox, um, A, you're, you're going to be locked into a silo and it's really not yours. And sure, you can get some export in some random format that a company allows you to have, but it's not very usable because uh, it can't be actually digest anywhere. Um, secure, you know, you should have the ability to encrypt your data if you want. Um, and it should support any identity type. So when we talk about identity, we're not talking about just users, or people, or companies. We're talking about IoT devices and everything else that needs uh, a digital twin in the concept that's been around for a while. Yeah, uh, one thing to add, um, it took me at least a minute to wrap my head around what decentralized web nodes was trying to do. And I'm, I'm sure you, most of you have heard of Didcom and other similar protocols. The value prop of decentralized web nodes is they facilitate interop by being the forcing function of the DID and VC ecosystem. The idea is if everyone is using a common protocol to uh, route messages to and from DIDs, store all your DID relative data and be your, your own personal data store on, on your device and in the cloud, then we've, we've solved interop. Even if you might use different uh, credential formats or did methods or really anything else. We need something to um, force that interrupt. Yeah. And leave it there, Gabe, because I, I want to note something that you kind of brought up. Um, Gabe mentioned DIBCOM, right? So you might look at this and say, well, you know, if something is sending data as a message or has some binary attachment to it, you know, wh why not just use DIBCOM? Um, there, there's a curious thing that happens um, when you use DIBCOM, which is yeah, DIDCOM is a message wrapper and it does provide you some things and it's it's not like it's useless or anything, but it it um, it kind of says, okay, well, we're not gonna solve the hard problem of true interop. We're gonna give you a way to send messages in whatever dialect you declare. But um, you know, from then on, it's, it's the responsibility of that particular dialect of message to do anything it wants in terms of after a message is received. And in practical terms, that's very difficult because most, you know, layers that are trying to exchange messages, messages for some user, personal or business purpose, they need to store the data after it arrives, right? They might need to transit that data to another uh, device to be stored there as well, right? So how do you do that? Well, each message family, like in practice, if you only have one message family in DIDCOMS, yeah, it's easy, right? You just, that's the, the way the message family does things after the message re is received, it's stored in the way that that spec says, um, you know, for that message family. The, the, Hard part is when you start having three, four, five message families you're supporting, and they all have to go reinvent storage, reinvent sync, reinvent replication, reinvent all of the things that happen after you receive a message. And it's it's sort of like an iceberg in that way. Like, you know, DIDCOM gives you the tip of the iceberg, uh, but then, you know, there's actually 80% of the iceberg is actually underneath there. Um, so so D-Web nodes are, are made to conquer sort of the entire iceberg of like, how do we actually force interop? So the two wallets can seamlessly communicate and replicate their state without having to be with the same company. Yeah, and there are so, two questions. Two questions I see. The first on uh, how is it similar to or different than the Aries cloud agents? I think conceptually similar. Uh, it's also an edge agent. The idea, and we'll get into this on the next slide, is that a DWN is running on your devices and also in the cloud and syncing seamlessly between them. And the second question, how similar are we to IPFS? Um, Daniel, I, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but we use the IPFS IPLD codec under the hood. Uh, the difference is that everything is private by default, meaning not transmitted on a publicly uh, addressable network, though you have an option to make your data public or permissioned if you want to. Yeah, let me, let me uh, expound on a little bit. So. Um, yeah, DWNs are thought of, the, the, our first incarnation is in TypeScript and it works in both the browser, um, like as an extension that actually stores your data there and, and as a server. The exact same code base uh, works the same way on both uh, client and server. They're seen as replicas of each other. It's a masterless system um, so that they, they will sync. 
Um, the difference with agents is that they, in the cloud, they do not have keys. So uh, a DWM being hosted by, let me step back. You, uh, you will have your data locally. That's sort of our square one that we, we want people to do. They may have a provider that provides a replica of their DWM in the cloud. And the reason primarily for that is because as you'll see later, we're, we're, very, we're app focused as well as credential focused. And if you're gonna get a bunch of calls to your, find your tweets or you know, your bio, your picture, your information, your resume, whatever, you probably don't want those calls all routed to your phone because it will melt your battery and you won't be able to do that. So in practical terms, you probably want a replica somewhere up in the cloud so it can actually handle traffic. Now, the difference with agent from agents is that that cloud node doesn't have your keys. So if something is encrypted there, uh, it, it can't do anything with it. So DWNs are dumber in that sense, um, in the logical sense than, uh, than agents are. Um, cool. So maybe go. Uh, yeah. And then, sorry, one more question on uh, did DWN support storage in both devices and cloud? Yes. And who's managing a user's DWN, a provider, a company, a user, either? Yeah, it's designed to be either. So we imagine that large infrastructure providers, similar to the Web3 providers like Alchemy and Infura, will host these, as well as traditional cloud providers who want to have one click installs on Google Cloud, Azure, Amazon. Um, in addition to having an easy way for users to run their own, much like you might run a, a Bitcoin or an Ethereum node. Yeah. Cool. So uh, the anatomy of an identity wallet as we see it is a little bit expanded from the traditional like BID, VC focus, right? Like obviously it has those things. It needs to do those things, right? Um, but in addition, we want generic DID auth capabilities. We need to fight back, in my opinion, against things like sign in with Ethereum that are branded to a specific underlying networks. Um, we need a generic did auth capabilities and authorization capabilities um, that span across all the different methods. And that's something we endeavor to provide. Uh, also data management, you know, if you add the piece of DWNs, it's not just about credentials and dids and one-off sort of handoffs anymore. It's about actually managing user data and having that data store local um, to the agent, which is the identity wall. All right. So a little bit of a network topology. Uh, you probably could piece this together. Um, you know, having a do of nodes locally and in the cloud, um, you, usually you're not able to directly address local devices or clients between people. You kind of have to go through something, even if you're like trying to do peer, 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 it's like stun and turn or, you know, some meet in the middle type thing. Um, if you have a cloud DWN, you might look up the DID of Bob and you want to send Bob a message and he has an endpoint for his highly available DWN that's either you know, maybe it's at one of the large cloud providers that's hosting it, or it's on his desktop, and he's like an NGROC pointing at, uh, you know, a desktop computer. And uh, you can send a message directly to Bob, encrypted to him via the public keys that are in his DIDDOC. And your, his DWN will pick it up and sync it back down to his device. So he'll be able to, to do whatever is required by that type of message. DWN support binary and regular messages, so I don't want to, you know, get it twisted that we're only talking about JSON and structured data. This is a full data store. It could store movies uh, potentially, so it is for all application use cases. Okay, uh, what does the app stack look like, or the, the the Web five stack look like? Well, you know, under underlying it, Web five is this decentralized web platform, which we think is composed of decentralized identifiers, uh, decentralized web nodes, and the DWA model, which we'll talk about a little bit. DWA is kind of like a a riff on PWA, which is progressive web apps, uh, installable. Uh, offlineable web apps that we are tweaking with some decentralized identity and data APIs. Um, let's, let me go to the next one. So what's a PWA? For anyone that's not really familiar with PWAs, this is an existing standard. It's actually technically not a standard. It's like a, it, it's like an, a, an expression that occurs when you've installed certain standards on your website, like service workers and other things uh, that make your website possible to be installed. So if any of you've ever been on a site like Twitter does it, um, I think Google Photos does it, where you see this sort of like thing in your URL bar that looks like a little install button, you can click it and it'll install the web app like a native app. And in Windows and other supported operating systems uh, like Android, it'll appear on your desktop. And you'll when you double click that and open it, uh, it will actually have like a frameless themed app experience, it won't look like a browser, even though it is a web app and it has offline capabilities and some other interesting stuff. 
Uh, that exists today. That's supported by all browsers and, and mobile browsers. What we're going to try and do with it, as Gabe will show with this next slide, um, is, is change that model a little bit. So PWA is typically have a service worker that's installed. That's a standard in all web browsers that manage going to a local cache or going to web server. So an offline node, they'll go to a local cache. And it's pretty much uh, you know, very specific to that website, that local cache. What we want to do is install a DWN SDK upon PWA install that um, has an augmented service worker that says, hey, go to local cache or go out to the DWeb and grab data from DWeb nodes um, so that the local cache is a DWeb node uh, for the personal user. And if it needs to reach out to people, do so over the DWeb. And it really is sort of, it's extending PWAs. So you can do all the centralized things you do with PWAs, but you can incorporate data from DIDs, whether they're companies or other individuals into your apps easily and have it cached and offlineable. So how would you use uh, you know, these DW, this, this whole combo of Web5? Well, in some basic examples that are pretty close to, I think what you all have seen, um, you know, if Alice knows a uh, bank's DID, she might resolve the DID. She finds the service endpoints to the DWeb nodes and she might ask them and say, hey, do you have a bank charter? Right? Can you give me a bank charter? Um, maybe she knows the schema of that particular credential subject data right, that she wants to ask for. So she'll ask for that. And the bank, you know, the bank's DWeb node might provide it back and she'll check it out and she'll say, okay, you're a legit bank or you know, whatever the proof is that the company wants to express. Uh, so this- And then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah this slide gets into a question that uh, Eric had asked us about thinking towards adoption uh, of Web5 and what we're building. And about a year ago, we released a white paper called TV decks that's available on our website. And it essentially is a way to have a decentralized exchange without being on chain. And how we do that is by giving everyone a DID and having messages relayed through DWNs, whether they're bids or asks. And it's a way for Alice to contact a number of PFIs, which are uh, primary or participating financial institutions. So Alice can say, uh, blast out a message, say, hey, I, I'm looking for a certain coin. This is how much I want to buy. You can get a whole bunch of requests back in a decentralized manner, and then choose to have a, a point to point interaction with any of those PFIs should she want to continue. And the follow up interactions with those PFIs could include something like uh, exchanging a KYC credential or uh, a driver's license credential or any type of IDV or background check that a PFI might need to do or really anything. And this is how um, TV decks could work, but it's it's one application that shows the, the power of what DWNs enable. And you can imagine this for any type of application. The, the protocol that we're building is not tied to TV decks. It is completely agnostic from any use case. Yeah, yeah and this doesn't go over any chain like, like uh, Gabe said, it's, uh, it's really just uh, exchanges between participants who can look each other up through decentralized means and exchange proofs and trust uh, with VCs and sort of facilitate their activities for business process reasons. And they all run over this conduit of Web5 um, you know, as, as a base. So go ahead. Okay, so yeah, I mean, you know, hotel people are in, in this call, so that's great. Uh, one thing that, that we were kind of interested, how many DWNs, let me ask, answer this real quick. How many DWNs can, should I own? Practically speaking, you probably would want one on your devices, um, probably one highly available one, whether it's at home or in the cloud, um, maybe one at home and a cloud. So I would say one per capable device and uh, either a home and or a cloud node uh, that's addressable by the internet. So I don't know, four or five, something like that. Um, travel plans, right? So if you kind of think about this, right, um, all of these things are, are, are data that should be yours. Um, and right now there's a few entities that are capturing it. They're reading your email, they're, they're uh, plucking things out of there. They're making itineraries, other stuff like Google does. But I think we can do a lot better. I think if these companies were to be writing this data into your DWeb node, um, you would have a much better experience and, and ability to sort of choose any app you want, whether it's TripIt or you know, TripAdvisor or something to permission um, so that you can have an experience over your trip plans, your hotel plans. Another thing that you know we found interesting is if you were a hotel brand or some sort of hospitality brand, you might want to know a certain set of preferences from the user. Um, so you might ask for those. You might say, hey, like tell me your 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 music types that you're interested in, your ambient temperature. We'll set your room 
in advance, are you, you know, do you prefer alcohol or not? You know, you will have a bottle of wine there if it's like some Hawaii vacation or something. Um, these are things that, that other entities can subscribe to. Um, and they're, they're pretty interesting in the sense that they can give users a more personal experience if users have data that they're willing to share um, through this common conduit. So I think of the next Yeah, one. this, I think this okay. kind of raises a question of how do we plan on getting adoption from hotel or airlines or car rentals? And I believe we'll talk about this a little later, but we have a couple of strategies. The first one being that um, we'll go for the little guys first. It, the, the big providers might be more afraid to part with their data or, or give up their user table. And that's true. So, so going with the, the smaller innovators first, they could potentially do something more innovative and show better value to their customers by adopting this kind of paradigm. I think the second main driver is a lot of the legislation that we've seen uh, in the EU and coming in the US and Canada as well about making personal data uh, toxic waste. And it will actually require most of these companies to handle personal data in such a way that makes it very difficult. And adopting this kind of thing where everyone's data is owned by them might just be their perfect solution. And of course, the third, um, third plan we have is for enabling an open source ecosystem that really fuels this development by making the barrier to entry into Web5 extremely low. And that's primarily what we've been building for the past year, a set of open source tools that do all this so that no company or individual needs to run or build their own from scratch. It should just work out of the box. And we're, we're getting closer, but it's, it's, a, it's still an ongoing development effort. Yeah, you know, timeline wise, we hope early Great. 2023. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. Just qu quickly, just to make sure uh, I understand this. So this is sort of like saying that the preferences, the user preferences. Uh, yeah. I, um, sorry, did, did someone did you break up or did I break up? I think they no, I think that, yeah. that was me is breaking up. Yeah, that's right. The user preferences. So the user's uh, preferences for their airline or car rent or, or hotel are theirs. In addition to the the copies of the information that an airline or a hotel would have, like you would own a copy of your reservation. You wouldn't have to view it on um, a hotel's website. Yeah, I mean, it, and that's just a choice to give people, you know, obviously the data that's represented across these things. And I, I think that It'd be smart if you know if the hotel and travel industry did realize that you know while while it's competitive um you can't be everywhere right sometimes there's just not a hotel brand in a certain location so you know your your first desire to um compete is is duly noted but like sometimes it's just not even possible so make sure your user can have the best experience wherever they're at um and i think that that's that's something that's um it's like frenemies, I think, in that way, in certain industries where uh, where you have to concede the fact that there's going to be people that can serve your user in certain areas and in areas you can or can't. Cool. So, yeah, major deliverables. Um, you know, we're we're almost at uh, we're almost at this this uh, third milestone. Right now, we do have initial implementations out of our SSI and SSI service SDK. This is mostly for uh, credential specific things. But we also have the DWeb node stuff that's in very early. It's, it's still an alpha. Um, it, it's being built actively, uh, check-ins every day. We hope to have that in quarter one um, so that we have something that you can really use um, that, that does all the things you would expect that we've kind of presented in the slide and is capable of hosting any data and supporting any type of app, um, be it Blue Sky. Um, I know this is kind of a strange topic, but you know we, we will be able to support all the things Blue, Blue Sky does and more. Um, in the sense that we act as a superset and a more general platform. Uh, but this is generally a roadmap, and I think you could expect maybe around quarter two, end of quarter two next year, you'll see, um, you know, the announcement in terms of Web5 um, being released. Um, yeah, I, sorry, I, I want to address uh, Chris's question here um, about privacy and universal, you know, universal addressable DIDs for individuals. Uh, we don't advocate for users to have a single DID or 
one that um, contains all their information. I think this architecture lets people have as many DIDs and identities as they want. Certainly, you'll want some sort of public profile, whether it's your your LinkedIn or personal site or your Twitter. But uh, having one and only one is probably not a great idea. And yes, plus one to a drum instead about using pure dids and uh, that's a great solution. I don't want to be using BIP32 type keys from um, a SECP curve or, or another one, which allows you to create essentially child keys based on a, a master key that you, you hold. And this would allow you to have um, yeah, many identities and you can choose your own privacy adventure, choose which data you associate with certain identities. And yes, we support any DID method. Um, so far we've implemented did key, did peer, did PKH, did web, um, and we're working on supporting ION natively and we're, we're completely open source. So we're open to supporting anyone that any community member wants to help out and contribute. Yeah, so I mean, to sum up, right, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to build a decentralized web platform um, that really enables uh, developers to, to build on using these three pillars to build real web apps and services. Um, we're not talking about on-chain contracts or UIs on top of, you know, Ethereum contracts or all of this stuff that, you know, Web3 thinks is, is like the, you know, cat's meow. It's like, we're trying to really like, let's get the apps that are on your phone to be more decentralized um, across the wide range. Um, and it doesn't require tokens or shady, you know, bag pumping or like dumping, you know, stuff on retail. It's, it doesn't require those things at all. Like we think we can have a better future for the web with, with just these, these more core technologies. Um, one last sort of note here is that our path to adoption is a little different than the traditional community it has, you know, the identity and credential community because we think the target audience of Web5 is much larger. Like you might have, you know, identity implementers who represent like 5% of developers and then the rest, you know, people who are even interested in VCs as developers that would actually name it is probably maybe another 10%. And I think we're actually being really generous there. It's probably, I mean, we're trying to be nice to people on the call here because we're all like identity people, but honestly, like identity implementers as a percentage of devs is probably like 1% or less. Um, and then people actually by name interested in VCs is probably like 5%. I mean, so we're kind of just trying to be nice. Um, most devs, A, have never heard of DIDs or VCs at all. Um, if they have, they probably have no idea how they work. They may have zero interest in them, but they could get utility out of them. They probably just don't know it yet. We think that uh, an interesting carrot to bring in the 85 to 95% of devs and use cases is to actually address the use cases that are a little bit more, a little richer, like app use cases, like what is decentralized Twitter, Craigslist, all these things look like. And those things, as Gabe will click to the next slide, inherently will pull in the requirement for credentials and these other things. In all of these examples, these are credentials, right? If you really are jazzed about credentials, you should be jazzed about first delivering users utility because very infrequently does user wake up in the day and say, let me go and acquire and present credentials. I am like super excited to do that. Um, they, they might say, I wanna go on Yelp and I wanna check verified ratings, which is a credential. Or maybe the Twitter blue check mark is a green check mark if you're a doctor and it's a verifiable credential. Your employment history on LinkedIn is a verifiable credential. Hotel reservations, you know, club memberships, event tickets are verifiable credentials. People don't care about the credentials, they care about going to the concert. So let's make sure that the concert goer and that, that experience and use case is supported by a web that supports their actual app. Because no developer is going to just in, include technology for technology's sake. They're gonna include it because there's a differentiated experience. Yeah, and this is something you all know that trust is everywhere. Uh, it's it's in the name of your organization. And anywhere there is trust, there can be Web5 and these technologies. Um, let's see, yes, we'll provide a link after after the presentation here. That's our presentation. Um, I don't know if we are allowed to take questions, Eric, we're happy to, or we could uh, be available offline as well. Um, hello, there certainly is time for questions. So, um, if you mean by allowed, you mean, uh, uh, is there time for them? That's, that, that's, uh, uh, is available. And if, uh, anyone now, if you would like to take questions, we can open the floor. Yeah, for sure. 
So um, yes, uh, Steve McGinnis, first hand I saw. Hey, uh, so I, I don't know if this is sort of an appropriate question, but this one that sort of came across my, my desk the other day. The, um, the um, agreement that you have with Circle, you just announced the Circle. Uh, I'm interested if, if you have any anything to say about kind of how that fits into this this view of Web five, specifically in terms of kind of on ramp and off ramp and and liquidity pools. Yeah, I think you know I can speak a little bit to the circle relationship. Um, you know, we our first use case on top of Web five is this TBX protocol that uses those three pillars to kind of you know send its particular dialect of messaging data over them. Um, and that's why we're building, you know, it's one of the exemplar apps we're building on top of this platform. Um, but it's within TVDEX, we're very focused on remittances um, and remittances, uh, specifically in the country, countries that you remit to, they're pretty interested in stable coins. Um, so a lot of the, the impetus to sort of have a partner that has one of the major stable coins is because that's, that's just part of the application that we're writing on top of the substrate. Um, so the circle announcement was about like, you know, sort of circling the wagons around, like, what is the KYC credential look like? Like, what's the data included that you would use for that? What is, you know, the exacts of the protocol that you, you would use to exchange that? And that's like on top of Web5, those are like, you know, protocol specific things about value exchange through TBDEX. Um, that's the bulk of it, is really just nailing down the things in that specific application area um, yeah. that might need to be industry standard. So, so would it be fair to say that it's basically a um, an, an additional component to your thinking and not necessarily a, a core strategic uh, portion of what I mean, life? it's core. I think it's, yeah, so it's core to TBD and like us as a business and wanting to like do a remittance business. I think for Web5, it's completely orthogonal. There's yeah. nothing about Web5 that includes Circle. Or, I mean, it's just like, you know, you, these these pillars that we showed you, like there's no actual link to even cryptocurrency really. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, Kyle, you're up next. Uh, great presentation, guys. Thank you. Um, one question that I had, I, I feel like I, this is the first time I've seen this, DWN. Um, I was following it until we got to the uh, picture where um, it was the use case, and there was discussion on there about allowing somebody else to do stuff to my wallet, essentially. Um, can you explain the security around that? Or is that per transaction yeah. or is that just wide open? Um, so you, you give people capabilities like other individuals or apps, like you may have an app that's like a music app, for instance, where you say, hey, like I want you to be able to access this subset of my data. That's like my playlists, my MP3, MP4, um, that sort of stuff and, and uh, be able to render that in the experience. That would be inside of a DWA. So if you install the PWA from your browser, it would then trigger your wallet and ask for you know whatever limited access, sort of like Android and iOS do today. They present you with what the site is, is or application is asking for, um, and then you can choose to install the site and give it that power. Um, it would then be able to write and read to that subset or portion of the uh, objects that fall under whatever protocol it's asking permission for. The way I think of it is like opening up a, a chat conversation between you and another party and allowing file transfer. But in this case, the files are useful and they're powering an application or an experience you're having, but it's yeah. completely permission. Okay, so it's like a, a live connection of data transferring back and forth. Um, for yeah, free. I mean, well, what I would, I would say is it's a capability that you're giving an application's DID. So apps have DIDs, they would ask for permission, you would permit their DID, and then their DID would be able to query and store against your logical set of DWNs, whether it's your committing to that one on the phone, it's then synced outwards. They, you know, they're they're addressing your DWNs all as if they're the same instance because it's a masterless system. Um, but they have that ability to invoke that capability to query and store data against whatever subset you gave them access to. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chris Buchanan. Buch Buchanan. Buchanan, yeah. Thank so you. thank you. Um, so first, uh, congratulations. Like this is awesome. Uh, I am very excited about it and definitely want to participate in the uh, open source work. So can you explain uh, just, you know, where do we go? How do we do that? Um, what do we need to, to get, get going? Yeah, I mean, so we are, the spec is, is still being heavily written right now. There's a, I have a PR right now for this protocol thing that will kind of like 
the install of apps will use this. Um, there's, there's some big sections left to write. I'm just giving an example. That's happening in diff under the storage and compute working groups, uh, dweb node, you know, work item. Um, if you join diff, even as an individual contributor, you can just you know, work on it there, be on those calls. Certainly GitHub's already open. Um, we have an open reference implementation of TypeScript um, that I'll put in the chat here. Uh, that is under under heavy development. Um, we actually pulled the guy who wrote Ion over from Microsoft, and, and he's the guy who's uh, leading that. Here, I just I just put it in chat. So this is our SDK. It's called an SDK, but it actually run. You can run it as a server, or you can run it in the client. It behaves the same uh, in both areas, and it'll store it locally to IndexedDB on web environments, or or to LevelDB uh, if it's instantiated as a server. So I would say that's like the dweb node thing. The dids, you can use really any did method. We've included a few, so that's not a huge topic or area of work. The SSI SDK and um, service is an implementation of VCs for issuers and verifiers. And Gabe works on that. It's both a SDK and a server that you can run to sort of manage uh, VC you know, uh, lifecycle. Um, those yeah. things are all in that same repo under TBD. Something to mention as well, we don't want to create any standards ourselves. We'll engage with other standards bodies. Today, that's mostly been uh, diff and the W3C, but we, we do make implementations of the code. And, and we also made an interesting choice to not wait until everything is built before making it public. We pretty much created all our, our public facing code and website before anything was built so that the community could help influence the process and, and they have. So the code you'll see is not done, but it's in progress and we want you all to help. All right, perfect, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Wenjing. Hey, uh, thanks, Daniel. Great presentation. This is my um, third time uh, hearing this, so I see great progress. Uh, congratulations to that. Um, one point I have always been a little bit uh, um, uh, thinking, uh, you know, maybe not a fully understanding, uh, is how and uh, who is going to be running the uh, platform for DWN. And you know, is that a community thing? And it is you know, how the business um, uh, economics are supposed to work behind it. And I know you know maybe some example in a particular industry would be very helpful. So I would like to hear that uh, from you. Yeah, and absolutely. So um, you know, users can store it on their own device. So that's that economics is easy. But outbound uh, hosted nodes is you know the question, right? So. Um, what I would point to is this is very much generic storage. It's not doing actually application logic. So it doesn't spin the meter too, too much. It's mostly a storage, a layer over storage, right? Um, light computation. So from that respect, you know, having been at Microsoft, one thing, one thing that, that uh, we did was we talked to like the OneDrive team and it turned out that, you know, their cap and OpEx expenditure per user is pretty much the same. They have to float like a certain amount of storage and bandwidth they a lot per user. And the average user is only using like 20 to 25% of their allotted five to 15 gigabytes, depending on, you know, if you signed up with a code or whatever. Um, so five to 15 gigabytes is what they're willing to give away for free. They were not blocking people from uploading encrypted data. So you could like use that five to 15 free gigabytes, however you wanted. Uh, upload currently encrypted data. They didn't really care too much about the cost of it. They they were loss leading on that a little bit because that's how they get paid accounts. They kind of wanted people to come in and store more data because no one ever really gets up to the cap hit. Um, <laughs> so uh, so for them, it's sort of like a, you know getting more people in the door for a toothbrush use case. So you have to look at these storage providers as they want you to actively use your data stores, you know your 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 storage uh, volume because. If it's only something you throw a few like receipts for tax purposes every year in, you're never going to hit the limit, and it's very infrequent. And you're not brand attached. Um, this is a way to create uh, more attachment, right? If you're using a DWN as the backing data store for apps and services, uh, you're now putting them sort of at the center of your life in the sense of that's one location of your data that matters to you. You might pay for it, right? And um, and that's sort of the economics for them made sense. So I think you'll see like. Storage providers, traditional cloud companies sort of jump in and give you a free tier of a few gigabytes um, and you know, maybe unlimited transfer or some, some same less than unlimited transfer uh, within reason um, for those bytes. So, so that's, that's how I would see that shaping up. And then I, you know, the home nodes is where we really want people to, to push to. We, we wanna make a one click install for Umbrel and all the different uh, noted, all the different uh, companies out there who currently make it easy to install. Um, server packages on like a NUC. 
Yeah. I, I think it could follow a similar business model like Daniel said to who runs your Google Drive or Microsoft Cloud or iCloud today. Um, and that's one option. Of course, if they're only the three big tech companies, we have a centralization risk. So we need to incentivize users and smaller companies to do the same as well. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you think about the conglomerate. So one thing, the, the, one thing about this is like our thesis is that the more utility you create beyond just credentials, the more that people come and, and value that like sort of hub, that center of value. And so their DWN, if it becomes the backing data store for even just a few apps together, you know, a few apps in, in, in concert that are all working on their phone, they'll start seeing it as like critical to their life. And they'll say, okay, we value this thing. Um, so, you know, the question of, would you want a paid app subscription to an individual app of, you know, a dollar a month or, or 50 cents a month over a year, or would you want to, you know, pay $2 a month for a data store that supports 10 of your apps? And you never have to really think about the apps individually. You kind of more think about, oh, this is like my critical, you know, personal storage. And yeah, it supports all these great activities and interactions I have with people and companies. And so sure, I'll pay a dollar or two a month. Like it's, it's the foundation, it's the backbone. Um, so that's kind of the way that we're, we're gonna try and articulate the teasers. Okay, so in, in the end, I think the success hinges on like a new, some kind of a new application this enable. And it's like a, you have a blockbuster movie you're watching. And therefore, you know, if every month I have to pay $9, that's not a problem. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think it'll, I think eventually, I think off, off the bat, you'll see free, right? Like there's just not, there's not a whole lot of reason people can't give away a couple of gigs of storage these days. I mean, if you've seen the cost curve of storage, Moore's law may be dead, but like the storage curve is just <laughs> dipping daily. Yeah. I mean, it's just like getting cheaper every single year. Um, so I, I think that storage, and this is a thesis that I have over, over like the next 10 years, you'll see like consumer level average storage is just free period because it's so cheap. And the value that these companies get out of public data, this is another facet of this. Why would Google even want to do maybe 50 gigs for free. Well, if you're putting your tweets um, on your data store there, it's not encrypted. Obviously your tweets are encrypted or you know, your resume, the whole point is not to encrypt that data um, according to a well-known DID. So if you're using a well-known DID and you have a bunch of public data, they're getting a lot of value because they're the first to crawl because the, the world we're going towards um, is, is about time and, 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 and frequency, right? Frequency and recency of, of information. That's why Twitter has all the same news that the 11 o'clock news does. It just doesn't take them till 11 o'clock, right? I mean, it's the same information. It's about frequency. So I think that in, in the future, the pipeline and having that fire hose of intentionally public data that people want to give you and don't feel bad about is actually in and of itself, a huge data lake that you can train AI and ML models on that you can do search over. And so they have an inbuilt incentive to want to be the sort of, uh, spray of that fire hose, if that makes sense. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jason Colburn. Hi there. Thanks. Um, so yeah, that was a great presentation uh, and a lot of questions uh, were, were answered that uh, clarified a lot of things for me. Um, I have kind of a tough question right now. I don't know if, um, if you'll be able to answer it, but what um, I guess I was taking a look at the core libraries it looks like they're written in Golang, uh, like the the underlying stuff. Is that correct? So SSI service and SDK, as Gabe is the uh, the author of these, by the way, are written in Golang. The DWN currently is written in TypeScript. That's right. So I was wondering what the reasoning for the choice. Like we did an analysis ourselves on uh, on you know a platform agnostic kind of tooling, what we were going to choose to use to build. We came out saying that I basically decided that Rust um, provided me the ability to to enforce more security boundaries using uh, using its memory models. And I was able to zero buffers and things like that a little more easily. Just things that I do typically when, I, uh, when I'm implementing secure code. I'm wondering what the choice impetus was. Like, was it just speed and, and time to adoption or is Go like better in some other area that I'm not understanding? Um, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. a good question, and we could get into a lot of nuance. We've had the Rust debate internally as well. I mm -hmm. think there are a few key factors. A lot of the serious cryptographers have used Go and maintained Go for, for good crypto code, and that was a concern. Um, another one being the simplicity of Go was really attractive for us as an open source project. We want a lot of eyes on this and a lot of people engaging in it. 
And we right. thought that Rust would considerably raise the barrier to entry for, for most developers. Um, another factor similar to Rust Go is WebAssembly compatible. So we've already proven out and we'll probably publish some code soon showing that you can use the, the Go bindings in mobile applications and other uh, web contexts like JavaScript. But yeah, you're right. I think um, Rust could have a better edge in terms of security, depending on your implementation, but also the, the cost to get there could be higher and uh, there might be fewer eyes on it, which could be a different type of risk. Yeah, for sure. All right, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, my other, I have one other question, if it's possible, is that, is it all right? Yeah. Um, so in terms of like, I don't know too much about carry at this point, but in terms of D, like uh, DWN versus carry for like lookup of, of like an ID, um, I, I really liked, I don't know if I'm, if I remember, I'm remembering this correctly, but there was a very strong binding to the, uh, to the ID in carry that actually encoded the public key as part of the ID or the, uh, or the, or a hash of the public key as part of the ID. Maybe I'm misremembering, but in this, in this case, I guess we're saying that there's going to be a did that refers to a document that, that has a public key associated with it. Um, and that that's the easier way to update the key, I suppose. Um, is there any concern like with, with like, I don't know, is there any sort of attack available that, that, that will be, that we should be considering because of this uh, weaker binding? Um, so it's not a weaker binding. So actually that self-certifying thing, we were actually the first implementers of a self-certifying DID that is, that is bound uh, to the actual cryptographic material. Um, oh, awesome. Ion, Ion, for instance, like Sidetree is actually, you could look at Sidetree as a superset of carry. Um, it, it intentionally does a lot more. Um, you know, it certainly has all the same properties that you just talked about. And like mm -hmm. when you create an ion DID, it's inextricably bound to the ID. It's always going to be uh, based on the material that you use to create it, uh, what Sam calls self-certifying, um, or he coined as such. Um, and so that was the first large scale network that I'm aware of that, uh, that had that property. Um, the other thing is, yeah, when you do updates to, to ion, a side tree based dead, um, you, you lock in a cryptographic lineage. Um, the difference between something like carry and this, to my knowledge, and maybe this has changed, is that, uh, you know, the others are typically a gossip protocol where it's sort of like there's no real true finality. Um, it's sort mm -hmm. of like you're like, okay, well, you know, I'm following the leader a little bit. And, uh, and there's a little bit of like wait, waiting and voting uh, between, you know, people you elect to be in your set of uh, testers and stuff with right. like something like, Ion or side tree, it's it applied to Bitcoin specifically. There is absolute probabilistic finality um, that the same you would get with Bitcoin. Like good luck trying to reverse a Bitcoin block. Like same could be said for a commission of a DIDs and, and a keys in Ion. Um, so if you're rolling or you're changing your service endpoints, you have the same assurances over time that you do with Bitcoin. Like it, it's got that. Uh... Yeah. So I call it a superset, by the way, because it's just capable of things that that carry isn't even interested in. And that may be for good reason. I don't know. But like one thing you can do in ION is like all the IDs that are registered in ION, for instance, are iterable. So you know all the IDs that exist in ION, like a, like a white page is sort of like, you know, it's, it doesn't say people's names. It's obviously big, long hashes, uh, but they, you can, you could go iterate all the did space. And if they have like service endpoints, you could ask, hey, do you have like this uh, piece of data from your DWM, right? You could go ask every DID, do you have something for a secondhand sales item? if you want to make like decentralized Craigslist. So it has a big whitelist of the world or white pages of the world, and you can ask questions. Now, people don't have to answer you. You don't know their name. You don't know who they are. They're just a, you know, an amorphous identifier. Um, but that's a, a capability that I'm not sure exists really in the same fashion in Kerry because it's just not, it's not a global universal um, deterministic system in that sense. I see. Okay, thank you so much. That was very informative. I would also add that uh, I think Andor is on this call and he is interested in implementing carry in our, our code. So it's something that we will support as well. Should you want to choose carry? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Nope. I was just going to say that carry was one of the first things that I was like super interested in implementing and it's uh, there's a ticket on it. Um, I'll find the PR and link it up to this. Yeah. I mean, this is not the same thing against carry. I mean, carry, carry, it's just a different set of trust assumptions and, and, you know, like, uh, and assumptions around features, like there, I would argue that there's just not a, a desire for some of the features that are in ION. So it's when I say superset or su su subset, it's it's not because it's maybe lesser than or, or bad. It's just they chose literally maybe not to have those same features. I don't know. 
Jumman would know for sure. <laughs> Why? <But. laughs> um, maybe since we are uh, getting to the end here, uh, the last two questions. So William Segos. Thank you. Um, so I guess I am probably going to be asking this on behalf probably of the people that have the vested interest in travel and hospitality uh, segment of use cases here. Now you mentioned that you are looking, I guess, you know, part of the plan is you want kind of those smaller players, brands, uh, vendors, whatever, you know, to be able to at least be kind of the initial step of getting something onto the market here. Uh, and you also mentioned that you're, you know, you're not creating any of the, the specs or the, or the standards or the schema. And, you know, I know we're kind of uh, trying to piece together the, some of the stuff for the hospitality industry. Could you just kind of like, just for like, uh, just explain like, you know, around how soon, I think you might've put it on a slide, but how soon you might be able to be at least able to have some of those initial test pilots in the hospitality industry and to like, could you just kind of uh, explain, you know, the little, maybe a little more about kind of um spec up because that was something we kind of had in our discussion today we we're trying to get our head around i know you mentioned it in your note yeah spec up is just a tool like you know respect in w3c it's just a tool that offers it's a little more fully featured than respect you can do like diagrams and you know uh, charts and all sorts of stuff it's just how you it's just one tool for writing specs that's all i would say it is um so don't need to be too concerned with it um it's just it's just the way that the specs are articulated now um in terms of like timing. So yeah, we, we're hoping that early in quarter one, uh, we are in the first half of quarter one that we are ready to start testing. Like people should be able to grab the, these pillars as one package and a web extension that's open source that you could rebrand if you wanted to. Obviously they'll look like yellow and black like TBD, but you can always just change colors. Um, and that should be able to authorize apps for seeing your data and writing to your data if you want, like the full sort of, you know, web five experience. So if you're a hotel site, you should be able to ask for preferences or data or something like that and test that out. Um, so it would yeah, be we'll, a browser extension is what you just said? First, yeah, that'll be the first type of wallet. We, you know, mobile app is sort of a little bit laggard right now, but, uh, but we're gonna do web extension first. So that would be the easiest way instead of having to, you know, upfront, you know, for these brands that might have obviously a lot of different infrastructure that it's kind of be, you know, some of it's very archaic, some of it's all over the place, just to be able to integrate something like that instead of building, you know, brand new. Yeah, that's, that's the intent. Like, um, I know we're going over for a second here, but the intent is that if you're a hospitality website, you don't need to like be like building a whole new app. Like you could just use this web five API that's injected into the browser or, you know, if it's on mobile and you could request permission. So you only have to understand the subset to request a permission and then make calls to that DWM, which looks like just like an HTTP call through the server to go get the data you've been permissioned or interested in. So it's, it's not a heavy lift. Like you should be able to have a small SDK and just integrate the pieces you want to start. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think that answered my question. Um, so I see that people are dropping off. Um, so just before we get to our last question, thank you very much for, for the talk. If you have to get going, otherwise, um, we have one more question from Subra. Uh, thanks, Carly. And, uh, thanks, Jen, <coughs> for, uh, giving this talk to our group. It's great stuff. Uh, I had a bunch of questions. Uh, fortunately, <laughs> we've covered some of those relating to the circle and, uh, business models and sort of the, the carry ACDC front. So I'll try and follow up with you later. I, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on your uh, comment that you made about, you know, people working on public data that might be available as a, as a lake. So, uh, yeah. So just think about it this way, right? Data lakes are sort of important in corporate spheres. Um, people try to create them. If you were writing an ML AI, uh, you know, sort of implementation or, or, you know, bot or app. The first question is, well, can I get semantically typed, uh, well-structured, very articulated corpuses of data that are organic um, in their generation so that they are representative of like target, you know, individuals or groups. And the, the ability there is like limited, right? So those training sets are, are hard to come by, especially in organic senses. If we, if DWNs took off, it would contain a bunch of intentionally public data, like tweets and, you know, I mean, things that people put out there 
publicly. I mean, they literally just put this data out there, right? Um, and if you were able to say, hey, like, I'm just going to go scan the, what we call the D-Web, right, of, of Web5 and go ask for certain semantic types of data that I know exist in, in or potentially exist in data stores, I could form up a corpus of, you know, organically contributed data that's just out there sort of in the public. Um, and that's not, there's nothing nefarious there, right? These are, I mean, no one cares if you read your tweets, right? Like this, that's the point of them. Um, so I think there's a lot of reason why people would uh, host that data because they get a lot of value out of it. There's where academics could go and run queries to like form subsets of it, if that makes sense, and then operate on it. Um, and there's nothing really wrong with that. I think ethically, if someone intentionally puts something out for the public consumption. Sure, thanks. I'll, I'll follow yeah. up on this. Yeah. So uh, we've uh, gone over a little bit. Thank you very much for uh, a very excellent presentation. And uh, uh, in the chat, if everybody uh, is looking to continue the conversation, there's a Discord and forum for uh, TBD to, to uh, keep the conversation going. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we will see everyone in two weeks for another Ecosystem Foundry Working Group meeting.